Michael Poole, Board Treasurer. Nathaniel Lewis, Board Trustee. Reyes Leo, Board Trustee. Mason Webb, uh, House of Lake Student Representative. Seneca Peters, South of High School Student Representative. Wanda Cook Robinson, Superintendent. Mm -hmm. Debbie Trump, Associate Superintendent for Administrative Services. Mm -hmm. David Turner, Associate Superintendent for Human Resources and Labor mm -hmm. Relations. Good evening, Linda Wood, Associate Superintendent for Instruction. And uh, keeping record for us this evening is Ms. Nicola uh, Christian. And uh, on camera, in the back, we have Mr. Chuck Cassis, who, thank God, is back with us now after a uh, serious uh, car accident. He uh, was unable to make the meeting last month. So he's back here with us. And on uh, on the soundboard is a new student tech, Ariana Geis, uh, ninth grader at Southfield Lake. So, welcome. Um, we want to start with the reports of our um, of our student rest. Let's go with Rachel. Rachel. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, Papa Laker has had many exciting events that took place this next <coughs> month. For the past two weeks, auditions were held for the musical Jesus Christ Superstar. This is the first time in the history of South of Public Schools that a mu musical has been assembled featuring students from South of Laker. Southland High School, SRAC, and University High School. Stay tuned for more information regarding this outstanding collaborative effort. Senior students Travis Frazier and Paige Williams received certificates of achievement for being finalists for the National Achievement Scholarship Program, and Senior Michelle Rosen received a certificate of merit for being a finalist for the National Achievement Scholarship Program. So congratulations <coughs> to them. Um, senior <coughs> Janet Essex was named the All-State Varsity Choir team as a soprano. This is the most difficult qualifying area in the choir program. Um, also, for the first time in 14 years, the South Alaska Orchestra complete, competed in the MSVOA Solo and Ensemble Festival. Students received, received Division One ratings for state level um, for the Solo Ensemble, and the Varsity Choir at Magicals competed in the MSVOA District Solo and Ensemble events as well. Ten students received top honors. They also sang in Italian, German, and Latin. Um, on Saturday, February 4th, Leroy Brown, Travis Frazier, David Colton, and Adam Orr received excellent Division I ratings at the MSCOA Festival in Hartland, Michigan. Um, these students will go on to the state solo ensemble festival. This was another collaborative effort amongst the high schools. Um, on Tuesday, February 7th, the South Alaska Student Congress hosted 50 students from na neighboring OAA High School for their February meeting. Tomorrow, the honor ceremony for students receiving a 3.0 or higher will be held in the school's auditorium. 30% um, of the students' body will be honored, so congratulations to them. Additionally, the boys' varsity basketball team has a cum cumulative 3.2 GPA, and the girls' varsity basketball team has a 3.0 GPA. February 15th, Lakeship held a second open house for incoming acres. The open house features the curriculum, the IB program, and the academy. On February 17th, Lakeship will have its winter sports pep rally in the evening. The Blackout Icebreaker Dance, sponsored by the Student Congress, will take place from 7 to 30 p.m. in the gym. Uh, via the Medical Academy, 42 kids uh, trained to be first responders, and um, the University of Toledo presented the School of Pharmacology. That's all for my work. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, now, Senator? Good evening, members of the board and residents of Southfield. Uh, first of all, I'd like to wish everyone happy Valentine's Day. Um, today, students celebrated Valentine's Day with the delivering of singograms sponsored by the Southfield, Southfield Student Congress and the uh, Southfield Choir. Students could also buy their sweeties, uh, pardon the pun, some sweets at the bake sale sponsored by the Class Board of 2012. They are accepting donations for the remainder of this week. Also featuring um, Valentine's Day News was the latest issue of the Southfield Day newspaper, <coughs> which was released last Wednesday. This week, members of the Principal's Council will be touring eighth graders of middle schools, um, such as Woodmont Academy, Brace Leatherby, Levy Middle School, Thompson Middle School, and Green Middle School, around Southfield High, so let's hope to make a good impression on them. Um, 
In news and sports, the girls basketball team are doing well with a record of 11 to 6, and the Blue Jay wrestling team won the league championship. Uh, two of the Blue Jay wrestling team members will advance to regional. Um, also, members of the traveling acting troop are visiting Southwood High for Florida Shakespeare's Macbeth on Tuesday, January, on Tuesday, February 28th. Sorry. All um, Southwood High School students are welcome, and tickets are eight dollars, and money will be stopped being collected this Friday. And that is all for my report. All right, thank you. Uh, we're going to move to the student staff recognition. Uh, first up, three students from Thompson K International Academy were named first, second, and third place winners in the 43rd annual America and Me Essay Contest, sponsored by Farm Bureau Insurance. Students Rachel Walker, Susanna DeGene, and Carlina Toons all received an award certificate for their achievement. As first place winner, Rachel Walker's name will be engraved on a plaque for permanent display in the school, and her essay advances to the state level competition where she may be eligible to win a cash award of $1,000. In addition, the top 10 essayists will be honored at a banquet in Lansing and meet with Michigan's top governmental leaders. The school's principal, uh, Ms. Paula Lightsey, is here to share information. Ms. Lightsey.
thank you. Supported 
us over the years and letting her husband spend plenty of time here. <laughs> <laughs>
Through this program and through the partnership with the University of Michigan, we will follow and support and enhance all of our seventh graders from the seventh grade all the way through their first year of college with the support from them paid for by the University of Michigan. This will enable our students to obtain more scholarships, more Pell Grants, up to $5,000 per student. They will provide professional development for staff. They will help us and support parent involvement and partnerships with the community. So we are elated to bring this new partnership to the board and to the community this evening. I also want to share with the board, as you know, we said we would keep you updated on Bryce Rattery School on their trip to the Japan to visit their communicative technology partners in Japan. And this evening, I want, I'm very pleased to share that we have donations from BASF in the amount of $2,595, Denso, $2,595, from Ruby Anderson, a retired teacher and volunteer at Brace Letterly, in the amount of $300. From Michael Cooper, from Harley Ellis Devereaux Company, $100. And from our former superintendent here, Dr. Marlene Davis, $100. So I'm very pleased to announce that the community is supporting Brace. I'm going to invite Ms. Lewis to the podium. Do you have any additional comments for us? Good evening, everyone. Good evening, board. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Dr. Cook Robinson for allowing us to uh, take this trip. And also, we spoke about this last year uh, when we were talking about some of the things that Brace was doing. We are <coughs> fundraising still for the trip, so we are still looking for donations and support. But we do have other people that are supporting us. Uh, people in the community, just people who have read the articles that we've uh, been on. Um, the Southfield Sun did an article with us, and the South of Eccentric did an article. So they were very interested, and they want to follow up. They even asked if they could come, um, if we would give them some of our video or any footage that we have regarding the trip. So they're very excited that we're going to be a part of this. We are communicating with uh, two schools. One is a junior high, and the other is an elementary school. So they're very happy to be partnering with us. And this has been an ongoing thing in um, over the last 27 years, I guess, with the partnership that Japan has done in education with uh, Michigan. It's been called the Michigan Shiga Program, and on different levels they've um, been doing exchanges. But because I have some affiliation with them, we were able to partner in this way to have our own school. So our students are very excited. We have a cultural club at Brace, and anyone can attend that club, even though they may not be going on the trip. So they're excited. The club started with about 25 people. I think we have about 80 now. So it's kind of hard to get them all in the room, so we've expanded to the um, cafeteria now. But they're excited, and that's a good thing, because they want to know more about the world around them. And the kids that are traveling, they know now that there's something more that they can go to, that this may be something that they do in the future for their, uh, their life skill, for employment. So it's a really exciting opportunity for them, and we're looking forward to going. And I have to say that um, Mr. Williams is going to be accompanying us on the uh, trip, and Dr. Cook Robinson as well. So we appreciate that, and um, one of the secretaries, uh, Ms. Goldson. So we're really happy about this, and we hope to have a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for you? I wanted to update the board this evening. You know we have had an ongoing issue with traffic at MacArthur. It's been going on for several, several years now. But I want to report that the school district, the city of Southfield, and the PTA have been working continuously on this issue. And I received um, a copy of an email today from several of the residents in the community, and we have been able to help support some of the traffic um, moving in a different direction so that it's not going right down the street. And um, several of the community members are quite pleased. They said the congestion is down. So I wanted you to know that we have not forgotten that. We continue to work on it and that we're starting to see some progress. Um, I'm not going to report on the happenings at Bussy. I'm going to leave that to you two ladies today. I think you got the email too. 
very, very exciting. I want to share with the board and the community that on Friday we sent out a letter, and I hope everyone received this letter. This would be all of the parents that have students in our K-8 grade. This letter went out to you from me explaining the new cut scores. Now, you've been hearing on the news that the MEEP has changed. The MEEP is the state test that we give. The way that they score the test is changing. So, I sent out a letter trying to just briefly let parents know that it's coming. Also, we include a website, and if you go to the Southfield Public Schools website, you can connect a link to the little video that will even give you more understanding about what's going on. In addition, our Division of Instruction is gearing up so that we can have town hall meetings to share with parents what those scores are about. And I'm going to invite Chuck, Mr. Chuck, <laughs> up to the podium who's representing the division tonight to tell the parents more about it. But please look in your mailboxes and pull out that letter. And Chuck. happy Valentine's Day on a personal level. Thank you. Uh, good evening, members of the Board of Education, Superintendent Cook Robinson, members of the Cabinet, and also members of the viewing public. Recently, as the Superintendent indicated, all families with students enrolled in Southfield Public Schools received a letter regarding upcoming changes as to how the state of Michigan will determine if a student is considered to be proficient or not proficient based on the Michigan Education Assessment Program or the MEEP assessment. Tonight, I'd like to take a brief moment to explain uh, scoring changes made by the state of Michigan and how this change will impact how student tests are scored. First, the MEEP uses what are called cut scores to determine uh, if a student has a basic understanding of the subject matter he or she is tested upon. These cut scores are separated into categories, and depending on how a student uh, scores in a given portion of the MEEP, the student will be assessed a level of proficiency, such as proficient or not proficient. Now, under the new scoring system being implemented by the State Department of Education, the students will need to answer a much higher number and also, as well as a greater percentage of questions correctly, to be considered to be proficient. In the short term, this may result in students who otherwise be considered to be proficient on this year's MEEP test to be deemed possibly not proficient based on next year's cut scores. Historically, any time that we have a change in the assessment, uh, what happens is you see, in many cases, a dramatic decrease in student proficiency scores. This phenomenon then will be felt by school districts throughout Oakland County and the state of Michigan, not just Southfield. So the real question is, what does this mean to Southfield public school families? The school district is committed to putting in place comprehensive academic supports. Uh, for instance, our Saturday school programs and our academic reading, writing, and mathematics labs, for instance and continuous school improvement initiatives to meet the new cut score challenge. Also, the district remains committed and vigilant in developing exceptional students, also exceptional learning experiences. Irrespective of the student receives not proficient based on next year's revised cut scores, this is only one measure that the district uses in determining a student's academic, gro academic growth and also their level of academic understanding. Southfield schools, educators, administrators, uh, from the board office to the classroom all remain committed to your student's academic achievement as well as success. And I'll be more than happy to entertain any questions from members of the Board of Education uh, regarding these upcoming changes with the cut scores. The way, um, the way this is being handled, uh, you know, this is a statement more than a question, it's kind of ham-handed and that they're just going back in reverse and changing, you know, information that when the children have already performed. So uh, y I would liken this to, you know, you going back and changing the score from the Super Bowl and telling the New York Giants that they didn't win. Right. Exactly. I mean, that's exactly what's going on in this case, and uh, it's kind of ridiculous how um, this is somehow supposed to improve overall student achievement. Uh, it's really a joke. Well, I mean, and again, President Buchanan, what you're really seeing is, you know, use another uh, you know, proverbial, it's moving the goalpost. Yeah. I mean, if a student scores 70% this year um, in, let's say, the three of reading, they would be considered to be proficient. The scores next year could move as high as a 10% a 10 point increase. Uh, so that student, even though they scored well this year, was considered proficient, 
next year that would not may not be the case. So that's what we're looking at. And this is a challenge that's being faced by you know districts throughout the state. It's not just a South Hill challenge, but the way we are attacking the issue is to be as proactive as possible. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the way I understood it, they were, they were going to do it retroactively as well as uh, to past last year, supposing you got very proficient last year and the score was whatever, 32 or something, and this year they changed the requirement to 36, so next year you would be somewhat proficient last year. In other words, they change it for last year as well as for this year. So it's really arbitrary, you know. If you're successful, they're going to see to it that you're not successful. That's what they're doing, in my mind. Yeah. Am I wrong? No. No? Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Now I'll have the report of my cabinet, starting with Ms. Trent. Good evening. Good evening. Um, as we were waiting for the, the governor to come in with his budget, we had heard rumors that there was going to be a surplus in the state aid fund, and there was, about $230 million. So there was a lot of conjecture. Are we going to get some of our 470 per pupil money back, which we were hoping, but the governor has decided again, no, that's going to hold. So the 470 that they took away from us last year is going to stay. We won't have that money. And then what they want to do for us this year is some more of his... Um, best practices money. The MESPR is money, best practices, but they've changed the best practices from what they were last year, so we have another set of hoops to jump through this year to try and get it. And there's small amounts, again, 100 and less than 100 per pupil that you can get that way. And then at the same time, we got the um, published MESPRs rates for our Michigan Public School retirement that we have to pay on all our employees. It's going up from 24.46% this year. 27.37 the year after and 31.21 the year after that. So that equates to about $187 per pupil for next year and $250 the year after that per pupil. So on top of the $470 per pupil cut that we got last year. And then in replace of that what we're getting is these small pieces of uh, best practices money which don't in any way, you know, they're not even a stopgap for the amount of money that we're losing. So. Um, there really is no good news economically going forward. We're in the same boat. We're just, you know, doing everything we can to keep us balanced so we can move forward with all the great things that we're doing. One of these days, her report will be different. Good evening. From uh, Human Resources, we have uh, one success. We have actually uh, ratified and approved our 2012-2013 calendar with SCA in uh, record time with our teachers so that's uh, mm -hmm. no, no small fee but we will have that calendar uh, on the website and uh, in the hands of the administrators uh, in its finished version uh, hopefully by the close of this week uh, ongoing labor talks continue with our MESPA group uh, we have some distance we need to cover in our talks but I'm uh, confident over the next several uh, weeks we have sessions scheduled that we'll begin to close the distance and uh, arrive at a um, collective bargaining agreement there. Uh, the remainder of my items are contained in action items uh, 6A and 6C. Thank you for your attention. Good evening again, board and community. Um, I'm always coming to share something I think that's always a little on the positive side. And I have to share with you that Saturday School is so successful. I'm very pleased with it, and I think that many of our parents in the community would echo uh, that, with that feeling also. And I have to share with you, Saturday School is going to continue to expand. I see wonderful opportunities to provide additional opportunities for our children at Saturday School. And so Mr. Chap, who uh, assists me just magnificently, uh, is coming to the podium and will share a little bit more and have a video for the community to see about our Saturday School program. Well, it's much better to be up here on a much more positive note. As the associate superintendent said, Saturday School is expanding, it's successful. We have positive feedback from families throughout the district. And the video we want to show you is very brief. Do we have a video? Um, we just wanted to show you a brief uh, five-minute video. And again,
again, just shows you what we've been working on during this fall semester.
video does come back after it's being buffered, you'll hear a story from two students that talk about how they were getting, going from D's, one was a D and one was a failing in mathematics in middle school, after going through this program, having that uh, small you know, teacher to student ratio and support. Um, the student, I believe, was over at Bernie's now getting an A uh, in their math course. So it is having a real impact. And again, I really wish you could see the totality of this video, but it speaks to that. Uh, and so we plan on continuing, you know, continuing this program. Uh, as the Associate Superintendent, Ms. Wood, has said we're going to expand opportunities, expand uh, in the areas of enrichment, uh, really reinforce, double down, if you will, on our academic labs, our math, our reading and writing. And it all serves a greater purpose, which is just to, you know, create great kids, create learning opportunities, and improve their skills. I was hoping. I was hoping. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Not a problem. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Maybe we should have had the kids do the good Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Trustee Rance asked me to put this on the website. I said that's not a problem. Okay. And we will be having um, round two, session two, registration K-8 Saturday school this coming, upcoming February 27th through 28th at Michigan uh, First Credit Union uh, over the corner of um, Evergreen and 696 from 11 a.m. until 6 p.m. both days. That information along with the brochure and the flyer will be available on the district's website uh, beginning tomorrow morning. Flyers being distributed to the buildings by the end of the week. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chan. I just want to add one more uh, informational item. Last night we had a tremendous gathering of parents at Michigan First Credit Union, and thank you, Trustee Smith, for uh, joining me uh, in our presentation to parents. But I, the most important thing I wanted to remind our community is that applications are now available for all of our specialized schools, and that includes MacArthur, that includes Levy STEM, that includes Bernie University Middle School, and all of our AP prep programs. And so the applications are available starting, uh, well, starting yesterday they were available, and they will be available through April 16th. So look on the website, uh, look on the school's website, and just ask all of those questions as you start to explore and to make choices for programming for your children. Thank you. That concludes my report. Okay, and now we'll have a report from Trustee Smith uh, from the Head Start program. Thank you. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, my name is Yolanda Smith. I was tardy. I want to apologize to the school board because I, in my haste, left my report at home. But um, some of it I remember, and Ms. Hill was kind enough to pitch it and uh, share some things in the hallway for me. So the Head Start Policy Council meeting was held on yesterday, February 13th at 9.30 at Busby Center. Uh, the new Policy Council has been elected and they are excited and ready to roll and just a, a true joy. And I see the historian is here, if you don't mind standing and waving. Um. Um, Ms. Hill, the director, reported uh, yesterday and today the federal government um, was in Bussey to investigate a deficiency, and from what I understand, the deficiency situation has been resolved. So that's a fantastic thing. <laughs> Ms. Hill, would you like to stand, Director, per Ms. Cass's request? <laughs> Um, the Child Adult Food Care Program, and these are estimates, and I will provide Ms. Uh, Nicole Christian with the exact numbers tomorrow via email, um, but over almost 2,000 breakfasts were served, uh, nearly 1,000 lunches, and just under 2,000 snacks to families. The Today was, February 14th, today was picture day with parents and, and their students. February 28th is dental, dental professionals are coming in. I'm, I, there's a name for them, but I don't know it exactly. But the month of February is Dental Awareness Month, which I think is fantastic to get the foundation for healthy teeth for our young people. February 29th is a black history program at Bussey Head Start. Uh, currently going on and wrapping up is the self-assessment. 
for BUSI to continue to have its grant, there's a self-assessment that's done annually. This is um, a, a tedious and long process that Ms. Katz, myself, and a number of other people participated in, including staff and parents and community representatives from the Southfield area. And that looks to be wrapping up on at the end of the month as well and determining if there were any findings. Once they're determining any findings, we will provide some support in making those things happen. Uh, the financial report <coughs> provided by Ms. Shereen Barker, the grant amount of $1,294,451, percent of that has been used, roughly $660,000 and $170. Uh, we are expecting that in-kind donations will equal about 25% of the grant amount. And I believe that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move, uh, given that there's no unfinished business, we're going to move right to the action items. Uh, at this time, I'll take a motion to open and approve uh, Report 6A, the consent agenda. So move support. Move and support. Are there any questions? Hearing none, I'll check. Ms. Secretary, would you call the vote? Yes. <coughs> Robinson? Yes. 
Trustee Smith? Yes. Trustee Williams? Yes. Trustee Poole? Yes. Trustee Lewis? Yes. Trustee Cass? Yes. Trustee Buchanan? Yes.
there's poor response time for the site manager um, to contact you and the contact information for the site manager, I know that we've had um, contact with has been consistently, um, you know, the phone number's been disconnected or whatever, so we've had challenges there. The customer assistance center is not, it's like a 1-800 number, it's not able to handle, you know, issues that are, you know, physical, they have there at the site. I mean, these people live in another state, so that's a challenge there as well. There's also conflict between the champions, their scheduling policy, and then the school's consistent change of after-school activities. And I'll give some, try to give some examples later. Um, they also force parents to pay for days that they don't use um, if, your, if your schedule changes due to circumstances beyond your control. And the example I'm going to use is uh, January of last year, my grandmother passed. And the way champions is set up, you have to schedule ahead of time, which I don't have a problem with that, but life happens, things happen. So the end result is I had to, my daughter obviously, you know, couldn't go to school for a couple of days because we had funeral and all that type of stuff. And I was still required to pay, you know, all money for a day. She scheduled ahead of time, but we couldn't plan a funeral. So you don't plan people to die. But at any rate, um, I had to go through such, you call the customer assistance center, Talk to, I had to go through too much uh, to get month, to basically get the money back. And based on their policy, I wouldn't have been able to get that money back. And in my opinion, it was a problem. So um, I, I think the, and the other example I want to use is the school has done an excellent job of having, you know, this year different after school activities. But if, for instance, my daughter had an after school activity and the, something happened with the coach. So, you know, all these kids had nowhere to go. Uh, well, go ahead. So, bottom line is, all the, the people had nowhere to go, and you know, the the, 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 the champion was not, you know, flexible with that. So, the bottom line is, things happen, and you know, with students, with school, and the champion's business model is not working. I think I'm one parent that I noticed, you know, some things challenges last year. In my opinion, it's gotten worse. I think, you know, the complaints will probably increase over time as the company if they're still. Uh, the district is still using them, I think it's going to be a, a, a problem. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. And um, uh, we want to make sure that somebody addresses um, your concerns and somebody will get back to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, we now come to board matters. And this is the time when uh, any of the trustees that uh, would like to address the community have that opportunity. Uh, Mr. Williams. Last week, I had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. I have a choice between D.C. and San Diego. I chose D.C. <laughs> 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 it was a good time for me, a learning experience, as this board continues to strive for excellence and doing my own more professional development. I think I made the I know I made the right choice. The National School Board Association Federal Relations Network involves local school board members like us from every congressional district in the country who are committed to grassroots advocacy for public education. The Federal Relations Network gives you an opportunity to make a difference in the education of our nation's public school children. The ultimate goal of the Federal Relations Network advocacy is to make public education a top priority of the federal government. I don't know if many of you know this, but federal government's budget is spent primarily on defense and security, 21%, Social Security, another 21%, Medicare and Medicaid, 20%, interest on our debt, 8%, safety net programs, 11%, scientific and medical research, 3%, transportation infrastructure, 3%, I guess you see where I'm going, education, 2%. There's a problem. So while there, we were given many courses, taught how to interact with our legislators, our governor's office, the governor, the congressmen and senators, and board president and myself went for this meeting and we split up the duties so that we could hit every office. We spoke to the governor's office representatives, we spoke with both our senators, 
Science Center for Devon had a breakfast for us, not just us, but all the Michigan delegations from Michigan, which we were the largest delegation of all the delegations there. Um, and we had a chance to really sit down and discuss some of the federal issues and how they impact education, as well as, you know, me and kind of got in the districts from our concerns here right here at the district. The major priorities for the 112th Congress, there were about six items that we were basically uh, speaking on. Restore maximum flexibility to local school boards in the delivery of federal education programs. This means we don't need a mayor, we don't need a DM, we don't need someone else to take over. We can do this and we've done this here in Southfield. We can govern this district totally and handle our fiduciary responsibilities as we're required to do. Reauthorize the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which incorporates the recommendation of the National School Board Association that represents over 14,000 local school boards across the nation. Also, increase federal funding for Title I and Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and other in education investments to rebuild our economy and improve competition. Support local school districts' flexibility in the federal child nutrition law implementation. Expand federal support for science, technology, engineering, and math education. And oppose federal legislation to create or expand private school vouchers, programs, and or charters. Well, we know the bus to left here in Michigan on the charter situation. But it does not mean that we can still give them a piece of our mind, which we so eloquently have done. Create an opportunity for the District has given me the opportunity to make that travel to D.C. and meet with the congressmen and our senators and our various reps. And as you well know, this is an election year. The things that we are asking for is going to be tough. We are asking the district, not only the district here, but also our fellow uh, families outside here in the district. To remember, you need to write your congressman. You need to be more involved than just the local level things that are going on right here in the school district. We need to start thinking bigger. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, Ms. Robinson? No. Mr. Lewis? No. Mr. Poole? No. Ms. Smith? Yes. <laughs> I thought Mr. Poole was going to say something about Black History Month. Uh, what? Well, I can't, since you put me out. About what? Say that again. Black History Month. Oh, Black History Month. What? Jim Watson. I'll take I just want to recognize Black History Month in, in a way that uh, probably has never been done before. I remember when it was Black History Week. That, that was back when it was Negro History Week. And it takes me back to think about the role that educators play in Black History Week. Uh, I had a, a, a teacher. The first African American teacher I had was in high school. And uh, he taught us from the bland history book, Black History. Now in his class, Black History was every day you came to his class. And we took the history book and we took it apart. But the history books back in those days were Christopher Attucks was the first American killed in the American Revolution. But this teacher, that he was a black man, killed in the American <coughs> Revolution. Well, he was right. But we were students that if it wasn't in the book, it wasn't right. Mr. Wright, it wasn't in the book. Go to the library. Check it out. In those days, we didn't have the Internet. We could go to real quickly and just Google Christopher Addicts and find out his whole background. But those were educators that were teaching us things that we needed to know along the way. Now, why is that so important? Well, he went on. He would make us to read different authors. Well, he, had us, he had me read, and as well as my other classmates at that time. Malcolm X. Why do we want to read Malcolm X? Okay, so we read Malcolm X. And he said, this author is going to be a great author. Okay. Alex Haley was the author. Actually, we read it. Understood the author. Okay. Where, where are we going with this? Well, 
He also had us read uh, another book that he came out with called Roots, The Saga of an American Family. Well, when you're reading this stuff and you're thinking of Ozzie and Harriet and Leave it to Beaver and all those other shows that they <coughs> couldn't quite gravitate to it. Well, again, this is a teacher teaching black history. Every day you came to the class from an American history book. I think uh, President Buchanan knows where I'm going with this. Well, fast forward a decade, <coughs> I'm having lunch with Alex Haley, and one of the few people that actually knew and read some of his work at that time. He was a very obscure writer. But he was promoting Roots, the television series, the saga of an American family. Historical. I think I was invited because I was one of the few people that could actually sit at a table and hold a conversation with the man because I had actually made some of his work. Let me fast forward a couple of decades. Uh, President Buchanan and I were having lunch, and the keynote speaker was LeVar Burton, who actually played Punta Kente in Roots, the saga of an American family. I don't think the ratings on that has, has ever been in terms of a series that's ever been beaten. Talked to LeVar afterwards and asked him, you know, how did you, you know, how did you get the role? Well, he is, uh, was one of the few people, when they first cast for the role, they couldn't find the right person, the right actor, to play Kunta Kinte in Roots, the saga of an American family. So, he said he was one of the few people that had actually read Malcolm X. And the author was Alex Haley. LeVar talked about the fact that he had dropped out of school to become an actor. And that was his first big role. I spoke to him because my son had dropped out of school to become an actor. So he signed a book uh, in, in that respect. But Black History Week went to Black History Month. And for me, it was, it was very much um, one of those things that came full circle for me as a young student matriculating through the public school system. So when we think back on Black History Month, let's, let's not forget the, um, the 1954 Supreme Court decision of Brown versus Board of Education, which declared the doctrine of separate but equal to be unconstitutional. Let's not forget the movement in 1963, the March on Washington, which led to legislation that resulted in the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Act. Things that we take today is take for granted, it's like getting up in the morning, breathing, drinking water, so on and so forth, going to school. 76 Black History Month was uh, an annual celebration of achievements for black Americans at, at a time for recognizing the central role of American, African Americans in U.S. history. U.S. history. The event grew out of Negro History Week, the brainchild noted of the notice historian Carter D. Woodson, a prominent African American. When Carter G. Woodson started Negro History Week, his purpose for the history of Amer African Americans was to become more significant because of the role that African Americans played in American history as a whole. Okay, so uh, let's remember, you know, it wasn't long ago when I saw a governor stand on the University of Alabama to prevent African American students from entering the University of Alabama. Let us not forget the Little Rock Nine where the school board members had to drive Little Rock Nine to class every day for a whole year. Let us not forget people like Viola Louzo, because we didn't get there by ourselves. A white woman who was killed for registering African American students in the South. Let us not forget our own Rosa Parks. And also, let us not forget President Johnson, 
who passed more civil rights legislation than any other president in the history. But more importantly, don't forget to vote on Tuesday, February 28th. Paul is open at 7 o'clock. If you're in line by 8, you can vote. It's a presidential um, primary, and um, happy Valentine's Day. Thank you, Mr. Pulitzer. Uh, Ms. Smith? Just briefly, uh, picking back with uh, Linda Woods, I'd just like to compliment Southwood Public Schools. I felt that uh, the curriculum that we offer makes me almost want to re-enroll as a kindergartner and just try it all over again. But um, I think uh, all of our schools offer so much, and it was at the point now where I could see some of the students, they would see something and they'd be like, oh, mom. But then another school would come up and they'd be like, oh, no, I think I like that school. So I just want the board to know and the listening audience to know that we've got some excellent schools in South of Public. Okay. Uh, yes, I have a couple of things I'd like to talk about. The first is the program run by Ms. Joyce Elagi, the Celebrity Reader Program. Uh, I had the honor of reading to two fourth grade classes in two different schools in the last week. And I'm telling you, if you have never experienced the joy of watching a whole class of students waiting expectantly for you to read a book to them, you're missing something in life. You should try it. Readers are always in demand. And uh, I've been in one class twice and at the Adler, and they know me when I come in. It's just beautiful, beautiful things. So think about it. If you need to, if you wish to be a celebrity reader, contact the, the uh, school board and they'll give you the contact. And the other thing I'd like to talk to you about is the legislation that's happening in Lansing. You probably all know that the, uh, the House of Representatives uh, and, the, and the governor and the Senate passed a bill to lift the lid on the number of charter schools in the state of Michigan and, uh, and also the rules for opening a charter school. So that now management, education management companies can come in from all over the country and open them in Michigan. I beg your pardon? All around, right. So anyway, uh, you know that there are 18 charter schools in Oakland County and half of them are in Southfield. Now they're opening it up for cyber schools. So cyber school is where a student can stay at home and study and take his lessons online. <coughs> there was a study uh, that was done on, on cyber schools and uh, completed, but the committee in Lansing did not refer to it because it says that charter schools do not do as well as public schools. As, uh, not charter schools, cyber schools. Cyber schools. And the bill is probably going to be passed this week, opening up Michigan to cyber schools all over the state. Unlimited number. Now a cyber school, a management company can come in and have 400 students in one school. And they're planning to give them the same foundation allowance that we get for our students. And you know that we spend a lot of money on our students in this district. All of our money goes to the students. So uh, I personally am not fond of this bill, and I hope that if you have an opinion on the bill, that you will contact our legislators uh, and talk to them. And if you ever get the idea that you want to go to Lansing to talk to them in person, let me know. I, we can arrange something. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Katz. Um, as Mr. Williams said earlier, we had the opportunity to attend the Federal Relations Network meeting in, uh, in Washington, D.C. last week. And uh, for myself, it was also a very eye-opening experience. Um, the focus really was on passage of the ESEA, which is the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Um, but what most people don't realize is that um, the ESEA, as it's known, is actually No Child Left Behind. And what we're attempting to do is get this le legislation passed now while we still have this Congress and this President in office. 
because more than likely we may be looking at a totally different body come next fall, which means that it will all go back into committee to be decided again, and it's already been 10 years that uh, we've had to live with this terrible legislation. No Child Left Behind, I think it had uh, the right intention, but it was uh, poorly executed and uh, focused too much on punitive as, uh, as opposed to uh, actually curing some of the ills in public education. Uh, public education is under assault. Uh, you can see it whenever you listen to any of the arguments taking place in Washington, D.C., uh, especially from those on the other side of the aisle. Uh, I'm watching as public education uh, being accused for all of the ills in society, uh, but as Mr. Williams pointed out earlier, they're only spending 2% uh, of the overall uh, federal budget on education. Uh, my, my question to them is, it's time for you to put your money where your mouth is. If you're going to say that this is a priority, then put the money there. Two percent of your overall budget doesn't tell me that this is a very important initiative. Um, so, uh, and, and I think too much of the emphasis has been put on charter schools, which is just going to be a drain uh, on the limited resources that we have in the first place because every dollar that we take in goes into educating our children. When you talk about charter schools and chartering agencies, they're actually looking at a profit motive. So my concern is that they're going to commoditize education in the same way that they have health care, and that's a real concern. A free public education has been always the cornerstone of our democracy. If you're going to start teaching our children based on you know, what's profitable, then you really have to be concerned about what exactly is going to be taught. So we, that's something that we all need to be concerned with. Now, so, uh, as he said, we split up our duties. So I didn't necessarily want to go and talk to our representatives because I know I have met with Sandra Levin, uh, I've met Gary Peters, and you know, kind of, we kind of know where they all stand, as well as uh, Tampa Clark. And I mentioned those three because, as we all know, we're we're in a unique uh, situation where we've been redistricted, and so uh, we're getting a lot of attention from uh, from the candidates that we probably never received before. But you know that's just the nature of the beast. I wanted to talk to people from the other side. That was the point that I wanted to make. So I went and sat in Daddy's McCotter's office, and it just so happened that Mr. McCotter wouldn't wasn't there to meet with us. Surprise, surprise. So we sat there and talked to the legislative assistant, uh, and you know, but we still impressed upon him the urgency of getting this bill passed now before we have to go through and re-educate a whole new Congress, and that that's just uh, that's just too much. On another point, uh, you know, I, I year after year, uh, as Ms. Bryant said earlier, I would sit and watch the recipient of the Whitman Award, and I was always just in awe of the things that the people there were doing. Um, you know, you never really see your efforts in the same way that somebody else does. But an award such as this is not something that any individual wins uh, on their own. Um, this, is, this award is really a reflection of, of a lot of different work and a lot of different efforts that I've been involved in over the years. Uh, initially starting, as she said, when I was at uh, Kennedy Elementary. So uh, there's some people that I really want to thank. And uh, first on that list is Diana Kirkland, the principal of Kennedy Elementary at the time, who uh, uh, did make those calls to me and did make sure that I, you know, she uh, relied on me uh, quite heavily. But that was okay because, uh, you know, when you're, I couldn't separate the success of my children from those of the children that surround them. And that's something for us all to think about. Because if we're going to get back to being the village and the village concept, we need to start thinking about the children that your children are involved with. All of them aren't getting the same level of, of love and appreciation and the respect that you know goes into making a whole individual. So you know sometimes it's just simply uh, you giving encouragement to that child to make that child better. But um, it was through that effort there at Kennedy Elementary that got me started. From there, I have to thank Dr. Kenton Cyber, uh, 
you know, for actually coming and pulling me out of uh, Kennedy and getting me involved at the district level. Uh, you saw my passion for um, for our children, and uh, so if you if you like the things that have happened so far, uh, you can thank Dr. Cyber, and if you don't like what's going on, you can blame Dr. Cyber. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also have to thank my colleague and, and, and friend Greta Reed. Um, Greta and I got involved uh, in the um, in the bond renewal campaign initially, mm -hmm. then the um, campaigns for our millage. And, you know, that kind of gave you an indication of, uh, you know, what goes on in the community and how everybody feels about education in the community. Uh, it, was, it was an eye-opening experience to see uh, from all facets of the community how they felt. But uh, Greta was uh, just there. She was great. She was uh, uh, just an excellent, you know, uh, partner in that initiative. And I thank you for uh, being there and still being here for the Southfield Public Schools. Uh, next, I have to thank uh, my current colleague uh, on the board, Betty Robinson. Mrs. Robinson and I uh, got to be known uh, here in the district as being uh, the go-to uh, group. I mean, there was a couple of times when there were things going on that we didn't necessarily uh, Appreciate. I remember when we organized uh, that group to go to Lansing uh, when they were attacking our Tony J money, and uh, you know we're like we're like warlords. She's got a, she had her group of people. We had, I put mine together with hers, and next thing you know, that that was changed. Uh, Lansing decided that they didn't want to see us coming up there. So, Mrs. Robinson, uh, Betty, thank you uh, for being a support uh, throughout all of this. Uh, but I also have to thank my colleagues here on the board. Uh, you know, this is uh, a different iteration of the board than uh, when I first got here, but every one of the uh, board members that I've had the opportunity to serve with has stepped up and stepped up bravely to help serve this community and, and help in this fight to uh, keep this district uh, out in front. So, you know, you. You definitely share in this in this award as well. Uh, I really have to thank my family um, for allowing me to do this, and my wife Belinda, who has allowed me to, you know, spend nights out away from the family, missing uh, uh, our own family events, missing basketball games, and some other outings while we were conducting board business, uh, and just being there. So. Thank you, dear. No. Um, future meetings. Our next meeting is February 15th tomorrow. We're having, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, February 15th tomorrow. It's not regular board meeting. It's a uh, student hearing. Uh, February 28th, 6 o'clock student hearing. And March 13th uh, is our next regular scheduled board meeting. And uh, this time we'll take a motion from the board to adjourn. We move in support and all those in favor say aye. Aye. And with that, this means.